The Wheeler Centre would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional custodians of the land on which the centre stands. We'd like to pay our respects to all elders past, present and emerging, and to the elders of all nations which this broadcast may reach. My name's Zuba Gavewa. I'm a writer and the host of the series of conversations for the Victorian Curriculum Assessment Authority. Maya Hodge is a Ladal and Yankal emerging writer and curator based on the lands of the Kulin Nation. Her practice is dedicated to disrupting colonial narratives and centering First Nations storytelling and autonomy. Maya's writing and poetry have been published by Australian Poetry, Kill Your Darlings, Craft Victoria, Hardy Grant, Cordite Poetry Review, and Overland. In 2021, she was selected as the runner-up for the SBS Emerging Writers Competition, and this year was shortlisted for the Udru Nunakal Indigenous Poetry Prize. Maya's Binion is a part of Writing About Personal Essays Framework in the Victorian Curriculum Assessment Authority's English and EAL List 2. All right, so Mayo, can you please tell me about your writing process? What kind of goes into creating a story for you? The writing process for me begins when I'm able to remove myself from chaotic spaces. So when I am able to leave the city and go up home to Mildura, where I was raised on Lachi Lachi and Barkindji country. And um, when I'm able to be away and focus in on my writing and listen to my thoughts, actually listen to what my body is telling me the stories come to me and when the stories come to me I think that's actually you know my ancestors talking to me as well and the process of writing Bidyan which means woman um, and many other things and Lado in my language uh, it began when I thought to myself I haven't been able to actually sit with my story and to be able to heal with it as well. Growing up in a regional place, uh, it was challenging. And so I, I thought that this was a great process. It was actually lockdown as well. So I had a lot of time on my hands and it was a really healing process. So I think when I start to write a story, I think about the way that the words can heal me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, you kind of talk about like sitting with your story. Obviously, it's your lived experience. So what kind of makes the difference between living your story and then sitting with it? It's a good question. I think we get really caught up in our little worlds and um, our lives that, you know, it's also just survival as well. Being a young black fella in Mildura was survival mode a lot of the time. I think you know, black kids grow up much faster than non-Aboriginal kids do. And so being able to reflect on what my childhood was like, which was beautiful, it was joyful, it was really hard, sometimes really confronting, you know, being able to sit with a ruminate and write that story down, it actually taught me a lot about myself, yeah. Amazing. So uh, you kind of spoke about moving away from chaotic places. And I guess this kind of ties into the next question I have, which is what inspires you to write? How do you kind of come up with ideas? And It's a good question. Many, many different things. I think sitting by a waterway and listening to the water, listening to the trees, the birds, thinking about stories my mum has told me. Um, those moments for me really are really ingrained in who I am. I think what inspires me also is music. I didn't realise that that was a thing until this morning when I was on the tram (laughs) and I was listening to music and I realised I actually write the way that, you know, music has rhythm, it has, you know, a beat and it has... The lyrics are also very poetic as well and I think how I write is very much how I might write a piece of music. And I didn't realise that until recently. (laughs) That's really beautiful. Yeah, I feel like all kinds of art are sort of interconnected in a lot of ways. And I I totally agree about how literature and music kind of similarly, they have rhythm and, you know, uh, lyricism and that kind of thing. So that's really interesting. And sort of tying into that as well, I was wondering, what do you think it is about art that 
is so healing. Um, obviously, yeah, like you said, you're inspired by music and you feel that uh, writing kind of heals you. I think there's this beautiful line in your piece um, where like as she read, the scars inside her softly closed over. So yeah, what do you think it is about art that kind of helps us to heal? Another very good question. <laughs> I actually work as a curator, so... And my family have been involved in the arts in Melbourne and Nam and Mildura for 20 plus years. So I couldn't escape it <laughs> growing up, which is actually, you know, I didn't want to escape it. It was so, um, it was a real privilege to be able to grow up around beautiful artworks, be around artists and musicians and go to exhibitions, sometimes dragged when I was a kid <laughs> to exhibitions <laughs> and you know, I wouldn't, I would never have it any other way because art plays such an important role in my life. For Aboriginal people, it is part of our storytelling, it's part of our resistance and it's part of our sovereignty. And it has always existed here in this place where we're sitting now, you know, thousands and thousands of years of storytelling and art making has been happening here. So I want to acknowledge that as well. Um, you know, there's many different art forms, being able to write or write a piece of music or dance or sing, you know, all of that is ceremony. So art making and arts practice and being able to write is returning back to culture and that's really important for lots of young Aboriginal people. Moving on to the next question I have for you, how do you go about researching your stories? I actually, I do a lot of research for the work I do and that feeds into the way that I write. Um, there's also a lot of research that I've done into my family history as well um, and speaking to family members about people like my great-grandmother, um, Ida Brookdale, who was an important person in the Lado community and she was you know, a really formidable person. She, I think her strength runs through my family as well. Even though we weren't able to meet her, my mum was able to have a connection with her while she was alive. And those stories run through my mother to me. So the research element is very much always connected to my family history, to my community, to the people that have raised me and the research that I do in, you know, the arts that I, yeah, I guess that's the research I do. So with that research that you spoke about, would you say that it's more of an active kind of research where you're specifically going out and talking to your family for the sake of researching? Or is it more sort of passive where you're just kind of as a way that your family functions, always learning about your history and your past? Yeah, it just happens in the moment. If stories are passed around at the dinner table, you know, my mum might off, off the bat just tell me a story and that will sit with me for a long time. And I might mention the story back to her years later and she would be like, you still remember that? Like, of course I do. Yeah. <laughs> Those stories are so important and they're important for how you might navigate your life and the way that you see yourself in this place as well. So, yeah, it's just very much... I, I don't go out with the intention of researching because, for me, that doesn't make sense to who I am as an Aboriginal woman. The stories that come to me come to me for a reason and um, the research that I might do for an arts project will somehow kind of fold over into something I'm writing and it'll make sense and it'll click and those moments of ah oh, that makes a lot of sense these two stories that have so many similarities that's a reason why I'm here writing it down is because they came to me for a reason so yeah that's what I think yeah right so it's all very sort of intuitive to you it's very intuitive it's very bodily I have to be able to embody the stories that I'm telling Otherwise, it doesn't make sense because they are my lived experiences. If I can't connect to the story that I'm telling, then I don't think I should be writing it down. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I totally agree. I feel like there's such an almost kinesthetic quality to storytelling where it feels like these stories are in your body and you need to find a way to express them, whether that is through music. Um, you kind of spoke about like playing the violin in your story um, or writing or whatever it is. So that's really interesting. Um, I'm really curious to know, how do you go about kind of taking those ideas that come to you and then putting them on a page? Do you have a specific kind of system that you usually follow when it comes to actually writing things down or does it vary story to story? Definitely. I think um, on that, I guess from the last question, that point of research, personally, it's not research, it's connection. So the connection has to feed through to how I might sit down with a, a story or a piece of writing and how it will begin. And for me, it's because I've learnt how to play the violin, very classically trained, there's a formula to a piece of music and it took me a long while to get it. Lots of music theory <laughs> and the way that I would sit down and write, there's a lot of repetition, which happens a lot in music. In a lot of classical scores, there's, you know, certain phrases that will be repeated throughout a score. And so when I wrote Bidnian, there were parts that might have a bit of repetition. For instance, the subheadings for each part, that was like a new phrase, a new thought, a new piece of imagery. And they broke up the piece and then also circled back as well. And um, I've, I'm also realising that now that's how I write. My, my, my writing is very much tied to the way that I was trained in, in classical music, yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, so with such an intuitive process, how do you sort of go about drafting? Because, you know, drafting can be very sort of methodical, systematic, um, and in a lot of senses, it can kind of feel antithetical almost to that kind of intuitive outpour to kind of go back and refine everything. So what is that process like for you specifically? I see drafts as part of the process I also think there's nothing wrong with a draft that you're not happy with as well. A lot of my writing starts with drafts that I'm not really that happy with, but there's a certain kind of beauty in that too because at that moment it's a time of very like unfiltered thoughts as well and you're not sort of checking yourself and thinking about, oh, that section doesn't match with this section, it's just free-flowing. And um, I think that's actually a really great way to start writing is starting to free, free style, <laughs> free flow with your writing. And yeah, I think drafts are really important. Is that the, did I answer that question all right? Yeah, um, I'd know. like to know more about sort of what drafting looks like for you. So what, yeah, what are the practical kind of elements of it? How do you actually go How about do I it? start? Okay, yeah, yeah cool. The way that I start a draft, I will actually free flow. So I'll start with a, like a stream of consciousness <laughs> and it might not make a lot of sense, but whatever you're thinking in that moment, you know, actually think about it like you're writing a journal entry and you're just, you're just purging the thoughts from your mind, from your, your body onto a piece of paper or on your laptop and start from there. And I think starting from your personal experience, a story of your family, um, you know, it might be a sentence from a book that you're reading that really inspired you and start from there. I think that's, that's how I start writing my stories is um, very much connected to what's inspired me that day or inspired me that week. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, kind of journalistic quality that you're talking about is really interesting because obviously Binyan is kind of written from a removed perspective. It's not first person. Um, so is that something that came from the outset as soon as you started writing it or was that a choice that you kind of made to give a different effect? It was kind of like I was stepping back from my own life um, in order to make sense of it. 
because as I said, it was during lockdown, so I was going through a lot of personal things at that time. And being able to go into a third person, sort of like eagle eye above my life, my childhood, was really important for that, that healing process. Also to recognise how far that myself and my family have come from that point. And I think it's also really cool to try different perspectives of, like, storytelling as well. Like, um, for instance, it's connected to this, but not really. It might be a source of inspiration to students. (laughs) There's an artist, um, uh, Betty Muffler, who is an incredible Aboriginal artist, and her work, her paintings... Um, are created from like an eagle eye perspective because she is a healer in her community. She's able to move between her body and an eagle body. So she's able to look down on the land from an eagle eye perspective. Um, And I think that's a really interesting way of looking at art making and writing practices is removing yourself into another person's perspective and it creates something really interesting and you might discover something about yourself in the process. So uh, was Binyan always written in the um, eagle eye perspective or did that kind of come through later on? It just made sense. I, I yeah. began writing from a third, yeah. t- a okay. third perspective for sure. Um, I think it helped me be able to write more painful moments in the in the story as well because I wasn't I wasn't sitting there going, I went through this. It was this other person went through this, but it was me. And that helped. Would you say that kind of links with, like, um, this idea that's kind of um, becoming more popular now of, like, the inner child and how kind of looking back at your childhood from the perspective removed but still sort of connected, is that kind of where that third-person perspective came from? Yeah, I think this inner child interest... um, The idea of the inner child is of interest at the moment for many reasons. I think going through a worldwide pandemic, we were forced to sit with our thoughts and reflect a lot. And for me, that was reflecting on my childhood and to make friends with that little girl again and to understand her and understand her pain makes me understand who I am today. I think that for my community, we're always thinking generations ahead. Never about the present. It's about, well, what about our kids in the future? What is life going to be like for them? So in thinking like that, we're always thinking about our inner child and what we would want when we were their age. So, yeah, I definitely encourage people to think about, you know, what, what were you like when you were a kid? What is the process of kind of reviewing and getting feedback on your works? How do you go about it? How do you deal with that feedback, whether it be positive or negative? How do you kind of implement it into your practice to make the best work possible? I think it's important to be open to critical feedback. I think it's also important to stand your ground, though, when you do receive feedback and you don't agree with it because of, you know, a cultural barrier. You might use certain words that some editors might not understand. For example, there's a lot of language in my writing. There weren't a lot of uh, edits that came back from Bidnian when it was published in the anthology, except for just grammatical things, which was um, important. Obviously, grammar is very important, but I think... There's a certain strength in, dis, you know, like bell hooks, for example, you know, that idea of writing the way that you want to write. And even if you make a mistake and the grammar's wrong or you've spelt something wrong or you don't capitalise anything, it's an act of resistance. So I think that if you're going to write, you know, write with your, your people behind you and the way that you want to tell your story and to understand that when you do put your work out there to be published, it will come back with certain edits. But it's okay to say no to those edits too. So that's what I always think. Like, I'm open to it. I'm very grateful for it. 
It's important to challenge your practice, but it's okay to agree, not agree with those edits as well. How do you sort of distinguish between that kind of val valuable criticism that you might not have considered versus uh, people maybe just not understanding what your work is trying to do? Yeah, it's things like words and phrases that are used in community or by my family that are critical to telling that story. So, for example, capitalising country when talking about your land or about, you know, if I'm talking about Mildura, I'm talking about Lachi Lachi country and I'll capitalise that. And f for the most part, I think a lot of um, publishers and editors are very aware of those very common things and some aren't. So it's important to be able to speak the way that you speak and that shines through your writing. Yeah, I think not losing your voice, if you feel like a piece of your writing is, your voice is being lost in the process of editing, then it's okay to to make that be known to the publisher or the editor that you're working with and ensure that your voice isn't being lost or being changed because the way that we speak from different communities is integral to the way that, you know, we might assert our sovereignty or speak about really challenging issues. We do it the way that we do it and that's fine, yeah. And so standing up to those edits that come back, would you say that's almost part of uh, how you, as a person, as an individual, disrupt colonialism? Yes, I was just about to say <laughs> that's actually my way of uh, disrupting, I guess, this, you know, the publishing industry has a long way to go and it can be challenging. It is a very challenging space to be in too, behind the scenes, there aren't actually a lot of um, First Nations editors. There are a lot of programs that are trying to di diversify these spaces. But because you aren't working with black editors with your writing, you're working with a lot of, um, you know, white followers or non-Aboriginal people, you don't really understand your unique voice and perspective from the community that you're coming from. So, yeah. I'd like to talk about how you finally get to a point where you feel like your story is finished or ready to publish. Is there ever a certain point where you look at a story and you think this is perfect or do you kind of have that thing where I feel like a lot of artists often it's never quite done and, and they want to change it. You said yourself that since it's been quite a while, it was kind of interesting to revisit. Do you still find yourself kind of thinking of things that you might want to change? Yeah. When I read it aloud for the first time a couple of months ago, I noticed a few things that I would change and realised there were p points in that story where I would change a phrase or, you know, cut out a repeated word or something like that because the writing process isn't really done a lot of the time because you, when you revisit your past work, you'd you'd want to make a lot of changes, right? But I think it's actually really important to look back at your work and see that archive of where you've come from too. I think there is real power in being able to just stop <laughs> and sit with your work and not feel like you have to rush it as well and you can take time with it. I think that there's a real like balancing act between overriding something and overthinking it. And sometimes it's okay just to be happy with where it's at, you know, send it to someone to look at and then come back to it again slowly. I'm very much about slow practice and it's okay to just write your story, be done with it and just let it ruminate and then you can come back to it. Yeah. So at what point uh, in that process do you find yourself with a work that, you're ready to publish? Depends on what the, what the story is. If it's a poem, I'm very flexible. You know, I might finish, it'll just come to a natural end. I think that's when I will stop. I think that's the point of stopping is when I notice that the story has come to a natural close. And if you try and push that, sometimes your meaning will be lost, yeah. 
Perfect. Well, thank you so much for being here today and answering all these questions about your creative process. Thank you.